Sorry, so just a tip, tip of the day from Neil. Why is Neil? If you're on the run, just get fat. Get, like, put weight on. Can't be identified. This podcast contains graphic descriptions that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Now, with that being said, welcome to the Mortal Musings podcast. Right, let's do this. Do you know one thing I've noticed what's different now? Okay, go on. With what? Like, this really pisses me off, right? So, I'm all about energy saving. Mm-hmm. Not not so much for environment, a little bit for environment, but more cost effective. So, I've always been one who's been quicker to hang the washing up outside rather than put it in a tumble dryer. Mm-hmm. But what is the fucking point? At least if you put it in the dryer... You know, it's clean and it's dry. Whereas you hang it up and half of it's got bird shit on it, berries, fucking shit from the ground. Shit from the ground? Spiders, fucking earwigs. Now, I, I don't think it's as common in America. They tend to just use dryers, as far as I'm aware. For this reason. But probably. over this part of the world, we tend to hang our washing up out, outside if it's good weather. But yeah. I'm, I'm fully with you. You know, for you saying about berries or bird shitting on the washing... Yeah. That's pain in the hole, but it happens to be where our washing line is, that there's trees that come over, so that's just shit. The earwigs and the fucking spiders, I'm fully with you. When it gets to this time of the year, I'm very paranoid every time I go near that washing line. Like, we we put the washing out, and we have brought it back in, and in that washing was the bedding. Mm-hmm. Our, the, the cover for the what goes over the mattress. Yeah. Eighth of it's purple. Berries are fucking all over it. Mm-hmm. That's fucked. It's not fucked. You can rewash it. it. Energy saving. Yeah, but it is what it is. So just put it in the dryer in the first place instead of putting it in the wash twice. I like you say this and you're not even doing the washing. <laughs> you go fucking do the wash, put it in the dryer. <laughs> we do sometimes though because you have to, when it gets to winter, and just you can't get it dry for love nor fucking money. Mm. I do find it weird though in America where it's like you don't do that. Isn't it considered like... They don't I, even I make coffee at home. They, they, they're kind of like, oh, I wouldn't put my washing up for people to see. Yeah. They, they go to, right. The, there's the, places where, sorry, I was going to say there's places yeah, like sorry, if you I live in, speak. Yeah. yeah, I will. You know, when you live in like flats, you can have like communal washing lines. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's normal thing. But like, they don't make coffee at home. They'll, they'll go to coffee shops. They don't do the laundry at home unless they've got a laundry room. That is crazy to have a laundry room. I would love that. If they haven't got a laundry room, then they go to get the laundry done. It's like a day thing as well. American houses are massive though compared to ours. Yeah, but have you seen it when, if they go to a laundry place, Mm -hmm. it's like the day. I I think it depends on the person. I put my washing in the machine and wash it. Whereas some people are like, well, this is for whites. And yeah. this is for this, and this is for... Oh, and you got to separate the reds. Don't don't reds go in on their own thing as well? No, or is it... colours and whites. Okay. And then some people do separate out for black clothes. Because, so when I was younger, I, I supported Sheffield United. And if white socks went in, if anything white, but it were mm. always white socks, I'd go in with the colours by mistake. I'd get pink socks. I've never had it happen to me once. Never. Are well, you lucky? Am I? Yeah. Seriously, you, you, it's you, never... You probably don't do the wash out enough. But if you wash your, I know a lot of people put on a really high degree, but if you wash the too hot, you're destroying, the, the, we talked about this in the last episode where you use your greasy hands, uh-huh. but if you wash them in too hot of a temperature, you're destroying the fabrics or the, the fibres of fabric. Mm. It's actually going to break it down. Your clothes won't last as long. Well, I just wanted to get that off my chest because I was putting the washing away earlier and I was like, well, that's fucked. Well, to be honest with you, now I want to get it off my chest because I agree with you. I have a lot of issues to do with washing and how different it is from country to country. Well, I say country to country. In Europe, it's pretty similar. A yeah. lot of places in Europe. Whereas in America, they're very kind of, as far as I know. Like another thing I was talking yeah, about. Hang on. What the well, fuck, America, right? How come you can't have a washing line in your garden, but you can have a pool? That's insane. You've got enough room for a pool, mm. but not a washing line. But I think they're embarrassed by washing lines. Well, in they case can... someone's like nicking the knickers. But I think it's like, I don't want people to see my knickers. Whereas we have no shame. Yeah, I wear knickers. There they are drying. 
But they can go in the swimming pool in a bikini, but they can't have the knickers hanging off a line. It's a fair point well made. It fucking is. I'm on one today. Mm. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight, cisgender white men. And the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth. And together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's get part two done. Right. You ready? Yeah. So in part one of John List, we talked about a little bit about John's background. Um, his essay of a fucking note. To his pastor, yep. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, he decided to murder his entire family. Mm. Uh, the bodies were left there for a month. Couldn't carry his mother. Could, couldn't carry her. Didn't have the respect yeah. to build up a bit of muscle before doing this and yeah. uh, carry her downstairs. Uh, yeah, he fucked off. And because it had been a month, the police had no idea where he was. Mm. And it would be 18 years before a significant development was made in the case. A lead. Is that what? A, a le- a, you're going to see. Okay. It's going to happen very quickly. So like I said, 18 years later. In 1989, America's Most Wanted aired an episode featuring the List family murders. Now, on America's Most Wanted, they would usually use a recent enough photo of the suspect. But because all the photos they had of him were years out of date... They hired forensic sculptor Frank Bender to create a bust of how John would have aged over the last 18 years. It's amazing how they do that. Yeah. Like guessing how they've aged. Well, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about it because it is very interesting. Because you don't know if they've gained weight, lost weight. Yeah. you, You gain weight and you start getting fat in the face. It completely changes your face. Yeah. So, during his time as a forensic sculptor, Frank Bender has helped the police track down ageing fugitives, as well as assisting in identifying decomposed bodies. Sorry, so just a tip, tip of the day from Neil. Why is Neil? If you're on the run, just get fat. Get, like, put weight on. Can't be identified. Can't be identified? (laughs) Not by a bust. Yeah, but the problem is, though, if you keep running into McDonald's, the workers at McDonald's are going to go, that's John. He's always in here. Uber Eats. When working from just the skeletal remains of a person, and to create people's features as accurately as possible, Frank uses a chart as a rough guideline to help correctly identify facial tissue density based on race, gender, and age. And not just that but to study the skull itself and notice the details and differences from person to person. Mm. He also works with anthropologists, odontologists, pathologists and detectives. And when I tell you, he got a pretty fucking dead on when he created this bust of John List. Mm. He explains how when an image is computer generated, it could just be, you know, a few wrinkles added in order to age a person. It's not taking into account how the wrinkles may form around specific features or aspects of a person or scars. Yeah, because like in it, some people might get more wrinkles or deeper wrinkles around their eyes, but some their eyes might start to droop. Mm. Or like you said, you know, if weight is a contributing factor, things like that. Another aspect to take into consideration is that a person could have actually improved their appearance, depending on if they may have improved their health or lifestyle. I think we've all seen, you know, the age compositions and a lot of the time they're pretty fucking shit. Yeah. He also requested a psychological report of John List to really get a sense of how he thinks and how things might have affected him in his life. So he enlists the help of Richard Walter, a forensic psychiatrist, and together they studied John List. How long is this process, do you know? Like, have they done this over years or...? I'm guessing it would have been a few weeks or a month or so, maybe. Okay. Because obviously they're wanting to get the episode out there and, you know. Yeah. 
It's been 18 fucking years, lads. You know what I mean? So while aging, John, he took genetics into consideration, also adding a scar that John had behind his ear, but to how it would look on his aged skin. He made his cheeks sort of droop, explaining that he thinks John would have carried a lot of anxiety with him, not out of what he had done, but from the fear of it catching up with him. He noted that he didn't think John would be vain enough to wear contacts, but he did think that he would have changed his style of glasses since then. Yeah. Do you, sorry, do you think this has ever happened with Crime Watch? You know, like, say with this, this has been 18 years, mm-hmm. they put up, you know, this picture, and they're like, have you seen this man? Does this man look familiar? Mm-hmm. Imagine being married, and you're watching Crime Watch, and you're like, it's my fucking husband. 100% I do think that will have happened. Hmm. On Sunday, the 21st of May, 1989, America's Most Wanted aired the episode in which they discussed the murders of the List family and displayed the bust of John List. The show was broadcast to an audience of 22 million. And thanks be to Jesus, it did trigger a call from a resident of Denver, Colorado. Sorry, that's that's really a small amount, isn't it? Is it? For for you think of the size of America, like a show like Crime Watch? It's not Crime Watch. Oh, I thought you said it was Crime Watch. It's (laughs) America. I never said that. I said it multiple times. America's Most Wanted. Oh, sorry. America's (laughs) Most Wanted. I thought it would be a nationwide show. So for it to reach 22 million. I don't know. I just thought numbers would be bigger. It's also an 89. So is that like, you know, if you were to air it now yeah would it you know the numbers be inflated oh, okay yeah. i don't know wanda flannery and her daughter ava were sat at home watching the show and thought hey that looks like john who used to live down the road so they sat there and they thought to themselves hey didn't john from down the road used to be an accountant <gasps> hey wasn't john from down the road a lutheran and uh didn't all uh john boy have a scar behind his ear and then uh, Penny dropped, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be me if I were the neighbour. It'd take three or four fucking things, and it's like, I better phone this in. <laughs> do you think? Do you think? Uh, like yours turned to me. Like, do you think that could be him? Couldn't I'm like, yes, it's full. Ring yeah, yeah. one. Get the phone. <laughs> Now, even the glasses that Frank had picked out, you know, I said he picked a similar style, but they were different. Yeah. He got the glasses pretty fucking dead on as well. How? How like did they do it? This is what I mean. Like, this guy was just, they're studying this man. Yeah. They're fucking really trying to understand who he was. Like they said, they don't even think he would have worn contacts. He wouldn't have been vain enough to care yeah. about that. Now, like I said, they were there like, hey, John. Yeah. Except they didn't say John. Wanda and Eva had known John as Bob. So, really, they're like, hey, that's Bob. I'm surprised he didn't call himself Frank. Yes. Why, no, Frank? Frederick. Uh, Frederick, sorry. I'm as bad as you, I'm like, yeah. (laughs) So, they call the police and they're like, hey, Bob is John. John is Bob. John is Bob, Bob is John. Yeah. And they tell them that he had recently moved to Richmond, Virginia and that he was now going by the name of Bob Clark. So the FBI head down to Richmond, and they find the accountancy firm that John Bob was currently working for. And they ask, Hey, are you Bob Clark? Bobbin. Bobbin? Yeah. Oh, is Bobbin? Yeah. Actually, sorry, you're right. They went down to the accountancy firm that he worked for, and they said, Is Bob here? Uh, and they go, Yeah. Bobbin? Is Bobbin? And they go, Yeah, there's Bob over there. So they go over to Bob and they say, hey. You right, John? <laughs> they go, hey, are you Bob Clark? And he says, yes. They ask him, are you also John List? And he says, no, I'm Bob Clark. Come so on, he- right. If you were him, at this point, if they've said, uh, <laughs> FBI walk in and say, are you also John List? They've got you. The jig is up. They've fucking got you. You think? But anyway, they arrest him because they didn't believe his tall tales. And after he's arrested, he's fingerprinted. And his prints match the prints given when he got the permits for the guns. 
The same guns that had been found in his desk and had been used to murder his family. No shit. I just can't believe it of Bob. Now, the name Robert Peter Clark that he was using. Mm -hmm. John took the name from an old college classmate that he had known. But the real Bob Clark would later say that he never knew John. Oh. Yeah. So it's a little bit weird that he's like, oh, it's no buddy. And this guy's like, I don't fucking know him. In 1990, John goes to trial. And during his trial, the jury was told of how John Liss portrayed himself to the world. A quiet family man. A mild-mannered Sunday school teacher with a deep devotion to his faith and strong sense of values. A man who had served his country. A man with qualifications and a good job. A court-ordered psychiatric report stated that John was suffering from obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. The defence also argued that John had suffered from PTSD from his time in the military. Also that he had been going through a midlife crisis at the time. Because that's uh, an understanding factor. Exactly. Like, okay, obsessive-compulsive personality... Buy a car, for fuck's sake. Yeah, like the obsessive-compulsive personality disorder and the PTSD, obviously, yes, I feel for the man. Mm -hmm. But a midlife crisis? Yeah, grow up. It feels a bit like throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks, doesn't it? That's a disgusting way of putting it. (laughs) Like, fucking hell. But am I wrong? No. (laughs) So that's how they wanted to portray John. The reality of the situation was that this was all about John and how he felt. John had struggled to hold down jobs. And not long before the murders, John had actually lost his current job, or his job at the time, should I say. Yeah. In order to keep up appearances, every day, John would get dressed for work, leave the house, and spend his day at the train station reading the newspaper, maybe taking a nap, until it was time to clock out and head home. (laughs) Yeah, it's creepy. It's this whole other, like, you know, situation going on. Well, it's the same with... um... It's the same with uh, your, your man on Full Monty. He did it. He, yes. He he told his wife he was going to work every day. She's there making his packed lunch. But at least he was going to the job centre. Yeah. At least he was trying to kind of like quickly get well, a job. at some point he was stripping. Okay, but at least he was doing something to make money. John was like, well, I'll have a nice old nap, finish me ha- ham sandwich, and yeah. then I'll uh, head back home. Put down and piss off. <laughs> What would you do if you walked into that? So, John's got no job. And you need to remember, they've got that fucking monster of a house as well. That's not fucking cheap. Mm. John was quietly sneaking money from his mother's bank account in order to keep the mortgage going. He also encouraged his children to get part-time jobs under the guise of them learning the value of money and responsibility. Really, it was just to financially gain from them yeah. after his loss of income. Now, you're probably thinking, but John, didn't you ever consider going on welfare? A man of his stature, Neil, how could he? Yeah. A lot of people are like that. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand it at all. You need pe- it, you take it. Yeah. You know? His belief was that it would have been completely and utterly humiliating for him and his family, for them to have even been in the position of having to receive support from social welfare. So clearly the only... So a lo- bullet in the ear is... Clearly the only option, yes, is the total annihilation of his family. But not him. Yeah. No, no, John gets a do-over. Don't forget that part. He was someone who was at least somewhat socially stunted. People who knew him described him as odd, reclusive man with few friends. He was judgmental of others' choices like how he felt as though his daughter's interest in acting was her moving away from the quote-unquote correct path in life. Yeah. And I think it goes without saying, quite a manipulative and callous person. And an arrogant bastard. Yes. Because of his fuck-ups financially and his belief that his family were becoming morally corrupt, this was the only way out. He believed that he had the right to take their lives, but that it was wrong to take his own and that it would hinder him from getting into heaven. So oh, there's your answer. that's why. hmm So he thought he'd be able to get into heaven 
after massacring his family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but to he... commit suicide, it's, oh, that's that's going overboard. Yes. They can't do that. That's the ultimate sin to him, apparently. It's just insane to me how... Yes. Like... <laughs> Look, he's basically just a self-centred prick who had planned out the mass murder of his entire family. And, and look, sorry if shit had ticked at all. Yeah, that. That was his defence, arguing that. But look, I can understand that the man is very religious and he's following what has been beaten into him his entire life. Yeah. I can understand that. But you don't get to play God, you know? If anything is what he's doing, not more of an affront to God. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now. Now what? No, because I said now, like I said, I don't think I said it before. Now, John was meticulous. He liked things done just so. And the murder of his entire household was no exception. So let's talk about how he carried out the murder of his wife, kids and mother on Tuesday, the 9th of November, 1971. On the day of the murders, he waited until his kids had left for school before approaching his wife. John shot Helen in the head at point-blank range while she sat and drank her morning coffee. He then went up to the third floor and shot his mother through her left eye as she laid in bed. Fuck's sake. The eye thing. Why? Yeah, you even had to say left. As mentioned earlier, he left his mother's body on the third floor because he had struggled to move her. In order to move Helen, he rolled her body onto a sleeping bag. Bro can't even lift. And dragged her through the hallway into the ballroom. After he had moved her body from the kitchen, he cleans up the blood before the kids arrive home. Patricia was first to arrive home. As she walks into the kitchen, he shoots her in the back of the head. Again, moves her body into the ballroom. So it's just, as they come in one by one, he's just shooting them, dragging them in? Yes. And that is why he was cleaning up the blood. Not the drag marks, but yeah. he was cleaning up the blood in the kitchen each time, so yeah. they didn't walk into it. Next to arrive home was his youngest child, Freddie. He walks in and his father shoots him in the back of the head and moves his body. After killing his wife, mother and two of his children, John takes a break from the brutal murders and continued with his day as planned. By now, John is getting a little bit peckish, so he made himself a sandwich. In the house? Yeah. Made himself some lunch. So he sat scoffing. Yes. With the family just laid there. Yes. And after that, he headed out to the bank to close his accounts, you know, just run some errands. And once he finished that, John heads over to the Westfield High School, his eldest son's school, Mm. where he would sit and watch his son's football match and cheer him on. (gasps) After the match, John and his son, John Jr., drove home. Now, once they get into the house... John attempted to shoot his son in the back of the head, but the gun misfired. As his son realised what his father was attempting to do, he began to fight back, which would result in John shooting his son ten times. But didn't he say in the letter he didn't suffer? No, he said John suffered the most because he struggled. Yeah, but I thought after that he still said... Oh, he still tried to say that because I was like shooting them in the back of the head... Yeah. It was... But it took ten of them. He, yeah. He, he, Fuck. Yeah. Overkill. Again, he would clean up the blood. He dragged his son's body into the other room, laying his body next to his siblings. Once John had killed his wife, kids and mother, he then said a prayer for his family before writing his letter. He had also gone around the home and cut his face out of all of the family photos. He then slept in the house overnight where his wife and children lay dead. That's weird. Mm Mm-hmm. The next morning, he lowers the thermostat to slow down decomposition and turned on the radio, leaving hymns playing on full volume. After that, John left to start his new life in Denver as Robert Peter Clark. Oh, (laughs) bye-bye. It is really scary. Like you said, the sandwich thing. Yeah. Sitting and making a sandwich, sleeping in the house overnight. It's all so calculated. You go to a diner in a hotel. Exactly. It's so matter of fact that... skin. (laughs) It's so matter of fact to him that, okay, I've done that task. Now I'm hungry. I need to eat. Yeah. Now I've got to close down the bank accounts. Well, I've got to sleep now before my big day tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah. 
So he moves to Denver and while out there, he gets a job, joined a church, made friends and even got married again. But you know, getting the job and stuff. Mm-hmm. What did he do with like social security number and stuff? That I assume he had a fake one. He's an accountant as well, so he's oh, going to know how to, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. do what he needs to do. His second marriage was to Doris Miller, a friend of Wanda, the woman who had called police after watching America's Most Wanted. So he was married when he got arrested? Yes. Ooh, bet that stung. Well, he and his wife had met at a church picnic and would go on to marry in 1985. John told her that his first wife had died of cancer and that he'd had no children. She had said that she never suspected anything and that she had no reason not to believe him. Quote, I do not believe it. I love my husband very deeply. I do not believe this is the same man. She, after all the evidence and everything, she's defending him. I don't know how she felt after the fact, but during the trial, that was her standpoint. Which, you know, in fairness to her, it's going to be such a shock. Getting yeah. not, not just that it's a different person to who you thought, but that he had murdered his whole family, mm. you know? Now, after hearing all the details about the shit show that is John List, or Bob Clark, a jury found him guilty on all five counts of murder, and John was sentenced to life in prison. He would later appeal on the grounds that his judgment was impaired due to PTSD, and also because his letter to his pastor should have remained confidential. Fuck off. Mm-hmm. He's going with data protection. Yeah. Yeah. Massacred his family and he's going for data protection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even get that at work. Yeah. In 2002, John was interviewed by Connie Chung in what would be his first public comment on the murders. Quote, I feel when we get to heaven, we won't worry about these earthly things. They'll either have forgiven me or won't realise, you know, what happened. I'm sure that if we recognise each other, that we'll like each other's company just as we did here, when times were better. I finally decided the only way to save them from that was to kill them. And that meaning financial difficulty. Well, it's it's not financial difficulty, it's his ego of going on welfare. Ex- and exactly, help and downgrading, and Ex- so you know, you you got this fucking mansion of a gaff. You know that's putting a bit of strain on you financially. I'm sure, just a bit. You lose your job, and I, you, you you're not just you're too proud to fucking go on social welfare. But I'd love to know just how much he was looking for another job. But he, I'm sure he was. But he, but hang on, he he might not have had to go on welfare. Like, I'd love to know how much the mansion was worth if he was to have sold the mansion. But he still doesn't want to do that, does he? He's got, he's reached this point of a nice lifestyle. He doesn't but want he to downgrade. But if if you're going to put a bullet in, in all no, their heads... Obviously, I agree with it, you. But to John, he's like, I can't have people see me living in this house in downgrade. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Obviously, I, I agree say, with you. Once he changed to Bob A, yeah. he, he, he was going to be in... Um, he weren't going to be in the same sort of lifestyle mm. anyway. Yeah. So, But the new people in his life weren't going to know that he had reached that level of society. See, if I'd have known him as Bobby, I'd have been like, fucking screw off. <laughs> <laughs> also during the 2002 interview, John stated that he is still completely devoted to his faith and that he is aware that he broke one of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. I knew it was wrong. As I was doing it, I knew it was wrong. I don't believe it, because it didn't it didn't affect him at all. He sat there, stuffing his face with a sarnie. <laughs> like, metres from him. Yeah. Like, I wonder if he sat there watching chips and stuff as well, like... The, the only... I'm, you know, not saying it's justifiable. The only way you could kind of rationalize in his head, if he, if, he, <laughs> is if he was in some sort of a state of psychosis. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because otherwise, it's just you're trying to play God. Yeah. Who the fuck are you? On the twenty first of March two thousand and eight, John died of complications due to ammonia at the age of eighty two. As for the house that the murders took place in. 
Well, back in August of 1972, less than a year after the murders, the house burnt down in a fire. The official cause was listed as arson, but no suspect was ever identified, and two years later, a new home was erected in the same spot. So it was him. He could have done that then. Well, I mean, technically, he could have. Because he didn't know where he were for 18 years. It it could have been him, or it could have been, you know, you do see it when it's like people in the neighbourhood who are just like, you know, yeah, yeah. fuck that. Yeah, it happened with uh, Ed Gein, didn't it? Yeah. And his reaction to it was just as well. Yeah. At the time of the murders, John was 46 years old and had been married to Helen for nearly 20 years. Chris Day, who was Patricia's boyfriend at the time, has said that he still has a programme from a play that she had signed. And he was also a pallbearer at her funeral. So, even now, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, a boyfriend that you had in high school, it's still a part of his life. She's made an imprint on him. Mm. And that is the case of John List and the horrifically brutal annihilation of his family. D- did none of that come back to you? No. Okay, hang on. I-, I said I'll show you a picture if you don't remember. And surely when you see him, you will. You just wait there. No. No? No. Where should I know him from? It's just a very well-known case, and I'm positive you would have watched the forensic files on him years ago. No. Hang on. Forensic files? There's about 800 fucking episodes. And we've watched every one of them. Yeah, so I'm not going to... I could watch one episode. By the time I get to four episodes on, I forgot that one. Easy. Yeah, fair point. I I thought something would have triggered a memory. Even if you didn't remember that, like you could have thought John List had committed a single murder, but you'd remember the name or the face or no. the America's most, like some detail of it would click. No. I'm sorry. Well, you don't be sorry because it's, it's all right. You can hear it fresh, I suppose. But it's just crazy to me. But, uh. Oddity. Yeah. Enough of that prick. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Stucky today. What's that? Well, you're going to find out. In Georgia in 1980, loggers are cutting down chestnut oak trees, which were then to be cut into logs of about seven foot long. Good wood, that. Is it? Yeah. Are you just saying that or do you know? No, 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 it's good wood. Sturdy, is it? After they've got them all cut down to size, they're loading them onto the truck when they notice something. Wedged inside one of the logs is the mummified remains of a hound dog. What's wrong? You okay? Uh, What? How did a dog get in a tree? I'm going to tell you. Well, as much as we can theorise. So the dog, which would then be named Stucky. Because he was stuck? Yeah. Cunt. Uh, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Arseholes. He was thought to have gotten stuck up the tree about 20 years prior to his discovery and he was thought to have been about four years old at the time of his death. And the reason for Stucky being up there in the first place was probably because he had chased, you know, a squirrel or another small animal up there. A what? Squirrel. Squirrel. Stucky had made it about 28 feet up the tree. I'm sorry, that, I I can't get up, that's tactless, that. Stucky? That is fucking horrific. (laughs) Now, the reason why his body was so well preserved, because the tree was hollow, air would carry up through the tree. So there was ventilation. Okay. Described as a chimney effect, it would carry away a lot of the smell of decomp that would attract insects and shit. Yeah. Also because of the tannins in chestnut oaks, they are lower in moisture content, so it was better for the preservation. Freaking tannins. So there you go, poor old Stucky. Would you like to see a photo? Of what? Stucky. In the tree? Well, like, he's still in there, but you can, like, see him now. No. Well, I'm going to show you anyway. And, uh, there you go. There's Stucky. That's fucking... That's Stucky. That's... Not happy? No. Oh. Well, I thought it was interesting. Why, why couldn't he have just called it, like... I don't know. He's in a museum now. For what? What do you mean, for what? It's a dog. What? Chased a squirrel up a tree. Yeah. Got stuck in a tree. Mm-hmm. And died. Yeah. What's that in the museum for? Because it's just the discovery. So he was found 
in 1980. Mm. But he's thought to have died about 20 years prior to that. So it's quite fucking old, this mummified dog now. Now I think it's interesting. A little bit, but it's very tight. I can't get over the name. Calling it Stucky. You're very upset by this. Yeah. Why couldn't they just call it fucking Spot? Or something. Like, just Don't be so basic. But at least it's not tackless. No, I'm not I'm not all for this one. No. no. This episode was a waste of time, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it's gone to shit. It's gone it's gone to the dogs. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh. Thank you so much for listening. Find us on Patreon, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. If you have a case suggestion, or maybe even your own story, email us at mortalmusingspodcast at gmail.com. 